issues freely. We thank you for Dr. Ross and Dr. Lyle and their, their Christian character and demeanor to debate this issue amongst Christians so we can enlighten ourselves as to the evidence for the age of the universe. I pray there'd be no technical difficulties, that we would uh, be able to discuss this uh, very important topic with, uh, with good Christian demeanor and uh, enlighten one another as to each of our positions. I thank you for everyone here, and I especially thank uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary and what you've done uh, for the past 20 years to that great institution to try and make people better equipped to defend the faith. We ask all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's start with Dr. U. Ross for the affirmative position. Dr. Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the theme is the universe. How old or young is the universe? And let me just spend a few minutes on what does the Bible say? Let me begin where I think we all agree. That we would agree that all humanity is descended from Adam and Eve whom God specially created less than, say, 90,000 years ago. So I am young earth and when it comes to human beings and our descent from Adam and Eve. And where Hebrew scholars agree is that one of the four literal definitions for the word yom that's translated day in Genesis 1 includes a long, finite period of time. So I believe that God created in six literal days. And yom is the only word in biblical Hebrew that means a long, finite epoch. Moses had no other option but to use the word day uh, to describe six long creation periods. And seven times in the Bible we're told that the laws of physics don't change from the moment that God creates the universe until the return of Christ. Here's one example from Jeremiah 33, where God communicates his immutability. I don't change, and the evidence that I don't change Look at the laws of physics. I have established the fixed laws of heaven and earth. Now this is important because all young earth creation models depend on radical alterations of the laws of physics, either at the fall of Adam or at the flood or both, and notice that scripture categorically rules that out. The other thing we notice from the Bible is that you get a beginning and an ending bracketing the first six creation days. There's an evening and a morning for the first six days, but you don't see that phrase for day seven. It's not finished. And three times in the Bible, in Psalms and in John and in the book of Hebrews, we're told that we're still in God's seventh day. So the seventh day, at least, must be a long period of time. And notice that Genesis 1 tells us that both the human male and the human female were created on day six. But as you go to Genesis chapter 2, a lot happens between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve. We're told that Adam is created outside the Garden of Eden. God puts him in the garden. He has a chance to watch the trees in the garden grow. He tends the garden long enough to realize there's more to life than gardening. Then God introduces him to the second aspect of creation. Creation is not only physical, but physical and soulish referring to the higher animals, and Adam is told to examine each and give an appropriate name for how God designed each of these creatures to serve and please him. And then we notice that God recognizes that Adam is alone. It takes time to become lonely. And then God performs surgery on him. He recovers from the surgery. He sees Eve, and the word recorded coming out of his mouth in Genesis 2 is hapa'am used more than 20 other times in the Old Testament, consistently translated at long last. So not only is the seventh day a long period of time, according to the Bible, the sixth day likewise must be a long period of time. And it was this biblical evidence that convinced Isaac Newton and his contemporaries that the universe and the earth were old. And this is significant because he's the first public figure to take an unambiguous stand on the Earth's age, and this was 180 years before Charles Darwin showed up on the scene. And for example, in a letter he wrote to Burnett in 1680, he says this, quote, Now for ye number and length of ye six days, by what is said above, you may make ye first day as long as you please, and ye second day too. And it was for these reasons that Hebrew scholars such as Gleason Archer concluded 
that it's not possible to sustain biblical inerrancy from a young earth creationist perspective. But the debate today is supposed to be predominantly about what the astronomy's got to say, and so I'm going to quickly review seven categories of evidences. There are many more, but I just picked seven out of the list. And we're gonna be looking at the spreading of part of the galaxies, the fact that the universe actually contains stars and planets, the temperature, the radiation from the cosmic creation event, light travel time, the time it takes for light to travel from galaxies to our telescope, the observed aging of stars, radiometric isotopes, and Earth orbit cycles seen in ice cores. So we'll just spend very quickly a few minutes examining each of these seven. Now where we would both agree is that the universe can be traced back to a creation event, not just any kind of creation event, but where God steps in and creates matter, energy, space, and time. So the space-time theorems definitively established that the God of the Bible created the universe. Now, because of images like this, we know how much the universe has expanded. We see the universe expanding from a time when stars and galaxies are very close together to where they're now much farther apart. And since the universe began in a very small size, literally the beginning of space and time, we have a simple way of determining the age of the universe. The age of the universe is simply the present size of the universe divided by the rate at which it's been expanding. Now, this assumes that the expansion rate hasn't changed much over cosmic history, but we know that from direct measurements. Astronomers possess a continuous record of cosmic expansion rates over 13 billion light years. So we know the expansion rate hasn't changed by more than 1%. And all these measures, without exception, establish that the universe is about 14 billion years old. Now, an independent way of looking at this, if the universe is expanding from a space-time beginning, and it expands in something less than one million years, then gravity will have no opportunity to collect the gas of the universe to make stars and galaxies. If the universe is less than a million years old, it would be nothing but dispersed gas, and of course life would be impossible. But also it can't be extremely old. If the universe is expanding slowly, then gravity is gonna collect all the matter of the universe and collapse it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars. And so if the universe, for example, were more than a quadrillion years old, everything would be black holes and neutron stars. Only if the universe is approximately 14 billion years old is it actually possible to have stars and planets where life now is existing. So the very fact that we live in a universe uh, with planets tells us it must be approximately a billion years old. That's why I define myself as a middle-aged creationist. I don't believe it's quadrillions of years or thousands of years, but something in between. Now, a third piece of evidence is to look at the cooling curve of the universe. I mean, we have the radiation from the cosmic creation event that we can examine at different look-back times. And what you see here in the graph is the cooling curve of the universe, presuming that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. And overlapping that curve, you see actual measurements astronomers have made of the past temperature of the radiation from the cosmic creation event. And notice that those measurements are perfectly fitting the cooling curve presuming that the universe indeed is 13.8 billion years old. And notice that for some of these measurements, the error bar is extremely small. Now, light travel time has been kind of the key of the debate amongst young Earth and old Earth creationists, namely that light from distant galaxies must take many millions of years or billions of years to reach our telescope. And there's no escaping the conclusion of a 14 billion year old universe unless one speculates either radically different properties of time or radically different properties of light. And this is acknowledged by young universe creationists. And they propose a number of solutions. Probably the four that are most commonly used is that God created light in transit. In other words, the light doesn't actually come from the stars and galaxies that the velocity of light was, say, a million times faster in the past than it is today, that distant clocks run a million times faster than they do here on Earth, or that light travels much faster toward rather than away from the Earth. Now, there are other proposals 
uh, but young earth creations now recognize that the other proposals are absurd. So I'm not going to mention them. And I'm not really going to deal with number one or number two because I think both Jason and I would agree that the first two, likewise, are absurd claims. So I'll just focus on three and four. Uh, and this is a model that's been proposed by Russell Humphreys of the Institute for Creation Research where he claims that clocks here on Earth run a million times slower than clocks elsewhere in the universe. And he's developed a mathematical treatment to try to sustain this. But what he is overlooking is we actually have clocks in the distant universe. In other words, his model is testable. And one example of such a clock would be a supernova eruption, where a star explodes, becomes very bright, and then takes several months to fade in its brightness. And when a supernova explodes in our galaxy, it takes about seven or seven and a half months to go through uh, this light variation. Now, if the universe is extremely old, in other words, expanding at a very low velocity, we would anticipate that everywhere in the universe, supernova would be taking about seven months to go through their light cycle. And if the universe is about uh, 14 billion years old, it would actually take less time. It's because of Einstein's theory of special relativity that if you've got galaxies moving away from us at a high velocity, the clocks will actually run slower. But the young Earth model here would predict that it would take about 18 seconds. So we can actually look at supernova and distant galaxies and see who got it right, the old Earth creationists, the middle Age creationists, or the young Earth creationists. And the data overwhelmingly supports the fact that it's middle Age. As we look at these supernovae, they indeed do take longer to go through their light cycle and not the factor of a million uh, uh, faster that young Earth creationists uh, would propose. Uh, but uh, my colleague here, Jason Lyle, has made the suggestion that perhaps the velocity of light actually travels towards the Earth at an infinite velocity, which means the light gets here immediately, and that it goes half the velocity of light when it's going away from the Earth. And he's making the point that we astronomers and physicists can only measure the return path of the velocity of light. We cannot measure the one-way path of the velocity of light. And so it's simply a convention within physics to assume that it's the same in both directions. But because we can only measure the return velocity of light, it's actually, one could speculate, it goes at infinite velocity in one direction and half the velocity in the other direction. Now, the isotropy or anisotropy of life's velocity is indeed a convention. We simply assume it's the same. But the directionality is not a convention. Directionality that focuses only on planet Earth generates a geocentric gravitational field independent of Earth's mass. An Earth-focused directionality with respect to the velocity of light actually introduces space curvature. It's a property of the theory of a general relativity, which now ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. And we do not measure such a field. Therefore, uh, there can't be an infinite velocity of light coming from all directions towards planet Earth. The conclusion here is there's no young universe light travel time solution. The universe really must be billions of years old, uh, given the fact that it takes that much time for the light to reach us. Now, this is acknowledged by many young Earth creation scientists. But the response is to say, well, the middle Age creationists have the same problem. And it's called the light travel time problem in the sense of what we observe is that the universe's light is thermally connected. But there's not enough time in a 14 billion year old universe for light to travel the necessary distances to explain the thermal connections. And therefore, it would have to be quadrillions of years old if this indeed has no solution. But unlike the young Earth creationists, middle age creationists do have a solution to the light travel time problem. It's resolved if inflation occurred when the fundamental forces of physics began to separate. For example, when the universe was only a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old, this is when the strong nuclear force separated out uh, from the weak uh, electro uh, force. Now, if inflation indeed occurred, in other words, where the universe expanded thousands of times the velocity of light when the universe was only a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, 
it would explain how we have a thermally connected universe where it's only 14 billion years old. And the way we can test this is by measuring what's called the spectral index of the radiation from the cosmic creation event. Now, if there is no inflation, that spectral index will measure to be 1.0 or greater. If it's simple inflation, it would be 0.95. If it's complex inflation, it will be between 0.96 and 0.97. Now, if you were to ask me this question a year ago, I would say we have no definitive detection of inflation. But now we do, thanks to the nine-year release of a W map of the cosmic background radiation and the first release from the Planck satellite. In both cases, they were able to measure the spectral index with sufficient precision as it definitively established that an inflation event indeed took place. Therefore, there is a solution to light travel time in a middle-aged universe, but not an old universe or a young universe. Now, a fifth evidence would be stellar aging. And we notice is that the universe is filled with burnt-out stars. Just like it takes time for a candle to burn out, it takes time for a star to burn out. Some examples would be white dwarfs, black holes, and neutron stars. Those are all burnt-out stars. Now, for white dwarfs, the burnout times are in the billions of years. So the fact that the universe contains white dwarfs tells us the universe must be at least several billion years old. And then when we look at these white dwarfs, we notice that they've been cooling for a significant period of time. We've got what are called cooling sequences that establish that many of these white dwarfs have been cooling down for billions of years. But we don't see black dwarfs. The fact that we don't see completely cooled off white dwarfs tells us that the universe cannot be trillions of years old. It could only be billions of years old. And this is based on straightforward thermodynamic cooling. The only assumption made here is that the thermodynamics of the universe behaves in such a way as to make life possible. So all of you here would be living proof that the universe must be approximately 14 billion years old. Now often the debate settles on radiometric decay. I'm not going to have much time to explain this. However, if the universe were 10,000 years old or less, then we would still be seeing Neptunian, Plutonian, and Technetium in both the Earth and the Sun. These are radiometric isotopes that decay in less than a few million years. So if the universe was young, we'd be seeing these elements in both the Earth and the Sun. But what if the universe were more than a quadrillion years old? Then all the radiometric isotopes would be missing in the Sun and the Earth. You wouldn't see any. But if it's 14 billion years old, then we would expect to see uh, no Neptunian or Plutonium in the Earth or the Sun, but we'd still be seeing Uranium and Thorium. So the fact that we see Uranium and Thorium in both the Earth and the Sun, but no Technetium, Plutonium, or Neptunian, tells us we live in a universe or a solar system that's billions of years old. Now, again, young Earth creationists recognize this as a problem. In fact, in the rate study from the Institute of Creation Research, they said, if the radiometric decay rates don't change, and again, the Bible tells us the laws of physics don't change, then the universe must be billions of years old. But they hypothesized that these radiometric decay rates were anywhere from a million to a billion times faster at the fall or the flood or at some other time. But we can prove that these decay rates have not changed over cosmic history. We can do that by looking at young stars at all different look-back times. And we see Neptunian, Plutonium, Technetium in these young stars at all look-back times, which demonstrate that there has been no epoch in the history of the universe where the radiometric decay rates change. Also note that we see middle-aged stars at all look-back times. So the fact that the universe shows a spectrum of stars that are young to stars that are old, everywhere we look over the universe, uh, tells us that indeed these stars have been existing for billions of years. And with respect to planet Earth, we have xenon isotope ratios in ancient zircons that established that plutonium was on the early Earth. But there's no plutonium today. But we got the isotope signatures that tell us that plutonium was here on the early Earth, and that the past decay rates at that time 
were the same as they are today. And plutonium-244 is a half-life of 82 million years, therefore the Earth must be billions of years old. But I found one of the most straightforward ways of demonstrating that the Earth on which we live is old is by looking at ice cores. This is our seventh evidence, and we have four deep ice cores in northern Greenland and three in central Antarctica. And in the one in Greenland, it actually shows that the Earth's magnetic field has remained between one half of its present value and twice of its present value over the past 35,000 years. So the magnetic field of the Earth is not an argument for a young Earth. And likewise at Dome C in Antarctica, we actually have a core drilled deep enough that it shows 800,000 continuous annual layers. Now, young Earth creations will argue that these layers are not annual, but we know they must be annual because they reveal known volcanic eruptions in the layers and eight cycles of Earth's orbital eccentricity variation. So, for example, we can see the layer that has the Vesuvius eruption of 79 AD and the Krakatoa eruption of the late 19th century. You can count the layers in between, and it exactly matches the historical records for the eruption of these uh, volcanoes. And then the Earth's orbit changes. The eccentricity of the Earth's orbit varies over a 100,000-year cycle. This, again, is straightforward celestial mechanics. And if you look in the deepest ice core, you can actually see eight cycles of the variation in the eccentricity of Earth's orbit, which means that, again, this really is 800,000 years of recorded Earth history. And by the way, in these layers are radiometric elements that verify that radiometric isotopes uh, indeed are decaying at the rate that uh, geophysicists claim they are. All seven cores yield the same result that the Earth is more than 100,000 years old. Now, very quickly I've reviewed for you seven categories of evidences, but there are hundreds of ways that physicists and astronomers date the age of the Earth and the universe. But with no exceptions, all reliable scientific age measurements are consistent with a 14 billion year old universe. Now, one demonstration of this from the young Earth community are two radio debates I had years ago on the largest Christian uh, station in America, KKLA in Los Angeles, and there was a debate that was moderated by John Stewart. And he asked the following question to John Morris, the current president of the Institute for Creation Research. Do you know any scientist who concludes, apart from a particular Bible interpretation, that the Earth is young? And John answered, no, I don't. In other words, there's not a single scientist outside of a particular Bible interpretation that would say there's any evidence for a young universe or a young Earth. And shortly thereafter, I had another debate on the same topic with Dwayne Gish, the vice president of the uh, Institute for Creation Research. And then John Stewart says, look, you've been doing this for over 40 years. Do you know any scientist who concludes, apart from a particular Bible interpretation, that the universe or the Earth is young, and Duane also said no, which means that this is not a scientific debate. The age of the Earth may be a biblical debate, but it's not a scientific debate. You will not find any scientists independent of this interpretation of a young Earth that holds that there's any evidence. Now, this is a very short debate we're having here this morning, but we did have an opportunity a couple of years ago to do an extended debate in fact, this was televised on national television. It was with the young Earth astronomer Danny Faulkner where we debated the age of the universe. Now, we're talking four hours of debate material here. But we used the example of Acts 15. Remember in the book of Acts, there is this argument about circumcision. Do you have to be circumcised to be part of the Christian community? And the Jerusalem Council heard the debate, and then they published a short statement basically saying, let's not make it difficult for the Gentiles to believe. And we actually had a panel of 13 evangelical astronomers that both Danny Faulkner and I agreed upon would be good to evaluate our debate. And uh, they produced, uh, well, they actually came on camera. So if you get this DVD product, it's at our table, you can actually see the re evaluation from the 13 astronomers. And we're also giving away free today uh, a page 
uh, that summarizes the statement from these 13 astronomers. So if you want to get their evaluation, what I love about it, it's written in the same spirit of Acts 15, a very ironic tone, carefully evaluating the debate and establishing what's crucial for the Christian faith and what's not crucial for the Christian faith. And hey, sometime today, I hope you download the Reasons to Believe app. It's free, uh, which will give you access uh, to all of our uh, podcasts and articles that we make available literally every day. Uh, articles are being published in the scientific literature that are giving us new reasons to believe that Jesus Christ is creator, Lord, and Savior. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ross. <clears throat> I told you you would need smart water. Seven lines of evidence for an old universe. I hope you wrote those down. We'll come back to them during uh, the Q&A period. And now uh, Dr. Jason Lyles getting set up for his presentation. So just give us a minute. Let's give Dr. Lyle a hand, please. Thank you very much. It's uh, good to be with you today, and I'm going to uh, defend what I believe to be the straightforward reading of Scripture, that, that God created the earth in six days. Uh, what is at stake in this debate? And if you could go ahead and just leave the PowerPoint up, I'd appreciate that. They don't want to see me. They want to see the pretty pictures anyway. Uh, what's at stake in this debate? Well, biblical authority, I think, is at stake. Do we allow the Bible to determine its own meaning, or do we allow the outside influence of secular scientists to tell us how we ought to read the Bible? That is a big issue, and that is at the heart of this debate. Biblical inerrancy. Does the Bible, is the Bible accurate when it speaks on matters of science and history? Uh, my, my colleague professes to believe in biblical inerrancy, but then the issue becomes biblical perspicuity. Is the Bible clear? Does it really mean what it says? Can the average person read the Bible and come away understanding what it means? And I believe, in, I believe that you can, and I believe that six days means six days. Uh, the gospel message actually ties into this debate very strongly. Because the gospel message is predicated on the fact that Adam's sin is what ruined the world. Adam's sin brought death into the world, according to scripture, right? But if fossils are hundreds of millions of years old, you got death before Adam sinned. And that is theologically significant, because if death is not the penalty for sin, then why did Jesus have to die on the cross? So you see, the gospel is connected to this. Uh, it is important. We're here to talk about the science uh, this morning, though, and I want to delve right into that. Astronomy is the branch of science dealing with objects and matter beyond Earth's atmosphere. It's always important to cover definitions when we do debates like this. The key word here being science. Astronomy is a branch of science. It's very important because science is knowledge about or study of the natural world based on facts learned through experiments and observation. And those are the key words there, experiments and observation. Uh, science is not the only way we acquire knowledge. There are other ways. You can read a history book and you can learn things, but that's not science because science involves experiments and observation. If you're not doing experiments and observation, you're not doing science, and therefore you're not really doing astronomy. So, operational science, which is the kind of science that puts men on the moon, makes your computer work, makes PowerPoint presentations possible, that's the study of the way the universe functions today. That's real science. Observations and experiments are always conducted in the present. And that should be pretty obvious, right? We can't go back in time and do an experiment. And that's going to come to, to bear in this uh, debate today. Age. What is age? Age is the amount of time during which a thing has existed. And it's just the dictionary definition of age. Age is a concept of history. It is a concept of history. It is not a substance that can be measured in the present by scientific means. And I hope that's clear. But people have misconceptions about it. They think, you know, you've got this rock and it's got a certain amount of age in it. And you measure the age, you'll point your tricorder at it, and it you know, scans it, and it tells you the amount of ageicals in there. It's, no, age is not a substance that can be measured scientifically. It is a concept of history. And therefore, it's not something that can be measured directly by science. The tools of science do allow us to measure in the present things like length, volume, mass, force, density, barometric pressure, velocity, acceleration, energy, but not age. Because we cannot observe or experiment on the past. We can't. It's gone. And so we can't touch it scientifically. Let's do a little experiment, okay? I want you to get out a laser, and I want you to point it at the moon last Tuesday. 
You can't do it, right? Because we can only experiment in the present. And so you see my point. Uh, science ca can't really measure or prove age. Uh, it's, very, it's very important to understand. To know the age of something, we must have information about two points in time. We need the information about when the object first came into existence, and then we need to know the current time. And so you need to know T1, when the rock first came into existence, and then T2, the current time, and you subtract T2 minus T1, that gives you the age. Now of these two points, which one can be measured scientifically? Only T2, because I can look at my watch, I can observe that in the present, and so that, that qualifies as science. Now I'm not saying you can't know T1, I'm just saying you can't measure it scientifically. What about the age of uh, other things? What about the age of uh, people? You can't measure the age of a person scientifically, right? Because you can know T2, we can look at our watch and find the current, the current date, that's pretty easy. But you can't scientifically tell when the person came into existence. And I'm not saying you can't know a person's age, you just can't know it scientifically. You could find T1 by other uh, methods. You could look at a birth certificate, that's a historical document that records when the person came into existence. That would give you T1, and you could look at the, your watch and get T2. In some cases, we don't know either T1 or T2. We can't tell when a dinosaur was born or when it died, and so we can't tell age there either scientifically. What about the universe? Are stars different? Are we looking back in time when we're looking out into space? Uh, some people say that. That actually depends on the synchrony convention. We might get into that a little bit later today. Uh, but even if that were the case, even if you're looking back at time, and you're saying, well, that's, see, I'm looking at the star back then, millions of years ago. Well, then you're not looking at it today, are you? And so you don't, you, you don't know T2 in that case. You still have only one data point, only one point in time, and you can't determine age using one point in time. And by the way, when we do observations in astronomy, we're doing them in the present. And so I think it makes sense to talk about the universe uh, in the present, really. We can discuss that a little bit more later on, perhaps. So it's impossible to prove the age of something scientifically. Now, we can have historical data and prove it other ways, but we can't scientifically prove the age of something because we can only experiment on the present. And to know the age of something, you must have information about two points in time, but scientifically, you can only know one at most. Since astronomy is a branch of science, and since the tools of science cannot prove a past event such as age, it follows logically that astronomy cannot prove the universe is old or young. You can't prove it either way. That, but that doesn't mean we can't make an estimate of age, right? We can use the tools of science to estimate but not measure or prove the age of something if we make certain assumptions about the past. What's an estimate? It's a guess. It's an educated one. It's a reasonable guess, as reasonable as we can make it. And it's sometimes called historical or forensic science. Uh, there's a couple of things you need to remember about historical science, though. First of all, any estimates about the past that we make cannot be scientifically tested or proved. You come up with a great guess about the age of a rock. Good for you. You might be right, but there's no way to scientifically prove it because we can only experiment on the present. Second, our age estimate will only be as reliable as the assumptions that have gone into it. And that is key, because uh, you, Ross, and myself, we make different assumptions about, uh, the, about the past, basically, and that will affect our age estimate. So let's consider some of these assumptions that have gone in to making an age estimate. I'll use a candle, because a candle, we know it changes with time, and you can use that to make an age estimate, can't you? And let's suppose that, we know, you know, you're watching that candle burn, you want to know how long it's been burning. You can measure the age of the flame, right? Can we, can, can, we, can we measure that? Well, we can measure the rate at which it burns today. And so we'll find, for example, that maybe the candle loses one inch per hour. That's kind of fast, but it makes the math easy, okay? So the candle's burning pretty quickly. And then what you can do is, now that's, that's science right there, because we can do that repeatedly in the present. We can measure it in the present. And then we extrapolate into the past, and we say, well, assuming that it, you know, has always burned at one inch per hour. You go back until it, the candle reaches its initial height, whatever that is, and that'll give you T1. And then we know T2 by looking at our watch, and you subtract, and that gives you the age. But of course, that assumes that you know the initial height of the candle, doesn't it? And uh, maybe you say, well, there's a factory that makes them, and it makes one-foot candles, and today it's six inches, it burns an inch per hour. So six hours it's been burning. But maybe the company also makes candles that are a foot and a half. You didn't know that and maybe that's the one that it, that it was. And that, if that's the case, then your age estimate will be wrong, okay? Because you, you incorrectly assumed the initial conditions. Alternatively, perhaps that somebody cut off the bottom portion of the candle and it's only been burning for a few minutes, 
but you assumed that it started at its, you know, at, the, at one foot, you would incorrectly conclude the age to be much older than the true age of that flame. Now, uh, we cannot scientifically know the initial conditions, right? Because you can't go back in time and see what they were. You can't ex observe the past or experiment on the past. But in some cases, they can't go beyond a particular value. And so that allows us to estimate an upper limit on the age, but not the true age. And as an example of this salt in the ocean, uh, freshwater c carries a little bit of salt into the ocean, because even freshwater has some salt in it and accumulates at 450 million tons per year. You can get rid of a little bit with salt sprays, but the rest of it just accumulates. You run the equation backwards and you find that the oceans, even being generous to the critics, the oceans can't be more than 62 million years old because at that point they would be freshwater and you can't have less salt than no salt. And so you see that's an upper limit. It's not the true age, it's an upper limit. The true age would be a few thousand years, 6,000 years, because the ocean started with a lot of salt already in it. So you see my point, hopefully. The point is that uh, the biblical age of the ocean is 6,000 years, very different than the secular age, and yet the salt content is consistent with the biblical age because it puts an upper limit. A lot of the age estimates I'm going to be talking about today are upper limits. They're not true age estimates. Uh, the other assumption, of course, that this candle burning experiment makes is that the rate has been comparable to what it is today. Uh, so that's, that's called uniformitarianism, the idea that present rates and conditions are reflective of past uh, rates and conditions. And so if the candle's burning at one inch per hour today, we assume it's always been burning at that rate. It doesn't necessarily mean a straight line. Uniformitarianism doesn't necessarily mean linear. It just means whatever it's doing today, that's what it's been doing in the past. So radi radiometric decay, for example, is exponential. And so the uniformitarian assumption would be it's always been exponential and the constant's been the same. Uh, but of course that might not be the case. It could be that there was more oxygen in the room in the past and the candle burned at a faster rate. Maybe it burned at two inches per hour when it started and then gradually went down to its uh, current rate. That's certainly possible. And if you didn't compensate for that, your age estimate would be off and it would be inflated by an enormous factor. Now here's the problem. Biblical creationists use different assumptions about rates and initial conditions and their age estimates than secularists use. Okay, my secular colleagues, for example, the University of Colorado, they make different assumptions about the past than I make. And so we end up with different age estimates. It's not that they can't do math or that I can't do math. We can do math just fine. It's just we make different assumptions about the past. And so when we compare, for example, the biblical time scale, what we'd get from a natural reading of scripture, six days and so on, the presuppositions that I would make in my age estimates are very different than what my secular colleagues would make. And uh, by the way, I, I, I know that Hugh Ross is not secular, I'm not claiming that, but he would embrace the secular time scale in terms of he would agree with what, what my colleagues at the University of Colorado would, uh, would believe in terms of the billions of years. Uh, the secular time scale assumes uniformitarianism, the idea that rates and conditions are basically constant. Uh, as a biblical creationist, I would not assume that, I assume catastrophism. Uh, the idea that rates and conditions might have been very different in the past. And by the way, I'm not arguing that the laws of nature are necessarily different, I'm just saying that rates can change. For example, the worldwide flood would certainly affect the rate at which sediment is deposited. It would affect the rate, think of the erosion that happened after a global flood. That would certainly be very different than the kind of erosion that takes place today. And so I do not assume uniformitarianism. Uh, secular time scale assumes to some extent naturalism. And again, I'm not saying that Euros is a naturalist, but th that time scale is predicated on the idea that stars and galaxies have formed naturally within the laws of nature, and I don't believe that. I believe that God supernaturally created the universe, that he spoke the stars into existence. He spoke and they stood fast. I believe the Bible clearly teaches that. And so as a result of these different presuppositions, we end up with different age estimates. My secular colleagues end up concluding billions of years of, of uh, cosmic and geologic evolution. Of course, most of them would, would include biological evolution as well. Uh, but if we take the biblical presuppositions, we end up with creation in six days, a few thousand years ago. Now, it will, it will do no good to simply assume uniformitarianism and naturalism, reject the biblical uh, creation and uh, biblical supernaturalism, and, uh, and then conclude billions of years and say, well, that disproves these, these things, doesn't it? It does no good to assume this worldview and then argue that proves billions of years and then that disproves this worldview because in assuming these presuppositions, uh, you've tacitly assumed that this worldview is wrong, which is to say you've begged the question. It's, circular, it's a circular argument. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that most of the arguments, in fact all of the arguments that Hugh Ross used today, assume uniformitarianism and to a certain extent naturalism. And so, so that's to say he's begged the question, because I reject those, those presuppositions, you see. How can we resolve a debate on worldviews like this? The only rational way to do it is with an internal critique. 
An internal critique is where you hypothetically assume the starting presuppositions of your opponent and show that they lead to a contradiction. And so I'm not just going to assume my worldview, prove my worldview, and then argue that that disproves the alternative. Rather, I'm going to assume these presuppositions and show that in many cases they lead to a result that is inconsistent with the billions of years. Okay? So I'm, I hope you understand that I'm not, I'm not granting uniformitarianism. I'm, I'm intentionally accepting it for the sake of argument to show that it leads to an absurd conclusion. This is a reductio ad absurdum uh, type argument. And there are many lines of evidence that we could use along, this, uh, along this, uh, this way of thinking. The recession of the moon, for example, I brought this up previously with a, a debate with Hugh Ross. I thought he's had a few years to think about it. He might have a, an answer to it now. The uh, moon is moving away from the Earth due to tidal forces. And we know that tidal forces go as 1 over r to the sixth power, which means as the moon moves further away, it slows down, slows down. Which means if you run the movie backwards, uh, it gets faster and faster and faster. And the uniformitarian assumption would be it's always been 1 over r to the sixth, right? And so if you run that movie backwards, you'd find that in 1.4 billion years, they collide. And again, that's, that's an upper limit because they can't be closer than zero. Okay, so it's not a problem for a few thousand years where the moon would have just been a few hundred feet closer to the earth, but it is a problem if you believe the earth and moon are 4.5 billion years old. Uh, spiral galaxy wrapping. You know, spiral galaxies, they actually wind themselves up with time. The inner portions rotate faster than the outer portions. We can measure that. We can measure the Doppler shifts of those stars. Uh, so for example, you have in the Whirlpool galaxy here. That's the linear velocity. When you convert it to angular, the inner portions rotate a lot quicker than the outer portions. And in fact, I've actually been able to uh, simulate this. Let's see if it's going to play. It's not going to play, is it? Oh, well. It wraps itself up um, ridiculously fast. I'll show you an image of the final result here in just a minute. My secular colleagues say, well, density waves come and form new spiral arms, but they believe the material is very tightly wrapped, in which case the magnetic fields should be very tightly wrapped because magnetic fields travel with material. They don't travel with uh, density waves. And so uh, we'd expect the magnetic fields would be very tightly wrapped if this galaxy is billions of years old, but in fact, the magnetic fields line right up with the spiral arms, what you'd expect if it's thousands of years old. So basically, if galaxies are 6,000 years old, that'll look something like that, because they haven't had a lot of time to wrap themselves up. I believe God created them spirals, and they've wrapped just a little bit. Um, this is the, the result of the simulation. That's, that's for a 1 billion year old galaxy. That's what it would look like, based on the measured uh, rates of rotations of the star, revolutions of the stars. And galaxies are supposed to be 10 billion years old in a secular view, okay? What, what do we find? Well, we observe that galaxies look like they're thousands of years old. It's interesting to me because you'll hear people say, well, why does the universe look so old? I'm thinking, what universe are you looking at? Not the real one. The uh, internal heat of the Jovian planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and, and Neptune give off more energy than they receive from the sun by a factor of about two, something like that. And uh, they can't do that forever because they're losing energy, right? They're just expending, expending fuel. You can't keep giving away more than you take in unless you're the federal government. Um, <laughs> But anyway, they can't do that forever. They're going to run out of, they're going to run out of heat, you see. And so, uh, you know, like take a potato out of the microwave. It's nice and warm. It's radiating that heat to space. Now, Jupiter's a bigger potato. It can do that for a lot longer, but it can't do it for billions of years. And that is an issue in the secular view. Uh, magnetic fields actually decay with time. We've actually been able to measure the Earth's magnetic field dropping over, um, we've been able to measure it for almost two centuries. It's an exponential decay from those measurements, and that's what we'd expect on the basis of uh, just basic physics. We'd expect that it would decay exponentially. There is a sinusoidal perturbation on top of that. Now, um, now we think during the, the global flood, the tectonic motions would have, would have affected that magnetic field, disrupted the currents, and you'd cause rapid reversals and things like that. But putting that aside, and just assuming uniformitarianism, for the sake of argument, the magnetic field would just have been stronger in the past. It has a, uh, we can measure the exponential decay. We know it has a half-life of 1,400 years. That means every 1,400 years it drops by a factor of two. You run it back 6,000 years, it had been 20 times stronger at creation. And that'd be kind of nice because that gives us increased protection from cosmic rays and things of that nature. If you run it back even 50,000 years, the magnetic field would have been 56 billion times stronger than it is today, enough to rip the iron right out of your blood. In fact, if you go back to 60,000 years, the Earth's magnetic field would have been as strong as a neutron star, which is the most powerful magnetic fields we know in the universe. It would rip your atoms apart. So it's, uh, it just can't be that old. Again, assuming uniformitarianism, it can't be that old. My secular colleagues are aware of this. And by the way, it's not just the Earth. The other planets of the solar system, a lot of them have strong magnetic fields. And my secular colleagues said, well, there must be some kind of recharging mechanism, you see. 
but they have to violate their own uniformitarian uh, assumptions to get that because the decay appears to be exponential as far as we can tell. The, uh, and also, their, their, their recharging mechanism, which they call a magnetic dynamo, predicted that the magnetic fields would be well aligned with the rotation axis of these worlds, and it's not for many of the planets, like Uranus and Neptune. It's not even close. In fact, my secular colleagues were expecting that the planet Uranus should have basically no magnetic field at all because it has no internal heat, and you need internal heat to drive that dynamo to recharge the magnetic field, allegedly. On the other hand, my colleague, uh, Dr. Russ Humphreys, he's got a model for how, how God may have started the magnetic fields. It's really clever, and this is one of the few estimates that is giving us a true age estimate rather than just an upper limit. Uh, based on Humphrey's model, the magnetic field of the planet Uranus should be within that little blue strip that you see there at the top. It should be somewhere between those two values. My secular colleagues believed that the magnetic field should be basically non-existent for the planet Uranus. And when Voyager 2 went past the planet and measured the magnetic field, the measured magnetic field is that. It's consistent with 6,000 years of decay. Isn't that interesting? It's nowhere close to what you'd expect for billions of years. Comets are another example. Comets are, are um, balls of uh, uh, ice and dirt, and they orbit the sun on elliptical paths, coming close to the sun, and then swinging back out far away. And uh, they lose material when they come close to the sun. And that's what forms a comet's tail. It's material being blasted away. We know the rate at which the material is leaving. We know the size of the comet. You can estimate a typical comet could last no more than about 100,000 years maximum before it totally runs out of material. And yet we still got comets. So if the solar system's uh, billions of years old, why do we still have comets? My secular colleague said, well, there's an Oort cloud that makes new ones. Basically a comet generator that we can't detect, but it makes new ones every now and then. And they're welcome to speculate on that, but I call that a rescuing device because, you see, I don't think there's any evidence for an Oort cloud. The bottom line is comets are an indication of the youth of the universe, or at least of our solar system. And there's evidence that other solar systems have comets too. So if the, universe, if the solar system is 6,000 years old, that's what we should see. If it's billions of years old, that's what we should see which is to say we shouldn't see any comets, and in fact, we do see comets. Uh, blue stars are another example of the youth of the universe. We find blue stars in uh, ubiquitous in spiral galaxies, especially in the spiral arms. And they're beautiful, and they cannot last even tens of millions of years. And my secular colleagues will acknowledge that, because blue stars, even though they have a lot of fuel, they, they expend it very quickly, kind of like an SUV. They got a big tank, but they don't get very good gas mileage. So they can't last billions of years, and yet we find them everywhere in the universe. Everywhere in the universe. And my secular colleagues won't even argue the age. They know that blue stars can't last long. And so they'll say new ones must be constantly forming. But you know we've never seen a star form anywhere in the universe, which is interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, to get gas to condense and, and fall into itself and form a star is really problematic. Gas wants to expand. I think you know that. You didn't hold your breath when you came into the room in case all the air should go to that corner. You expected the air to expand and fill the room, and that's what it naturally does. Now, once God makes a star, its own gravity will hold it together. But in space, the force of gravity is tiny compared to the force of gas pressure in a typical situation. So in a 6,000-year-old universe, you'd expect to find lots of varieties of stars. Star Red stars can last long periods of time. It doesn't mean they're old. It just means they can last that long. Blue stars can't. You'd expect to find both. If the universe were billions of years old, you'd expect only the red ones would be left. Or you'd at least see stars in the process of forming. And what we do see is consistent with thousands of years. Really compelling. Of course, there's a lot of other lines of evidence I could mention that are indicative of youth. And I don't offer these as proof, because as I mentioned earlier, you can't prove scientifically the age of something. I'm just showing you that there's an inconsistency in the secular way of thinking in terms of uniformitarianism and naturalism. In many instances, it leads to results that are inconsistent with its own assumptions. What's the best evidence for creation in six days? What's the very best one? You know, it's what God has said in his word. Exodus 20, 11. It's part of the Ten Commandments, written in stone by the finger of God. Verse 8, in six days you'll do all your labor. The seventh is the Lord's, and he explains that. And verse 11 is the explanation. Because in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested one day. He did it that way as a pattern for us. Using the same word for day, by the way, in the plural form, yamim, which never means a long period of time in the historical narrative. So um, it's very clear that God made in six days. It's easy to get intimidated, isn't it? Oh, the secular scientists, and there are brilliant scientists out there who say the earth is billions of years old, take my word for it. God says I created in six days, take my word for it. Who are you going to trust? That's really the issue, isn't it? That's really the issue. And I'll, I'll concede that secularists are almost unified, are virtually unified on billions of years. 
And so uh, I'm not surprised that, that Dr. Morris gave the answer he did. Is there any scientist who, apart from Scripture, concludes thousands of years? No. Is there any scientist, apart from Scripture, that concludes resurrection from the dead? No. And that's something. Well, we have some great resources on this. I'd encourage you to come by and check out our booth. Creation Basics and Beyond is our latest book on, uh, on the research on these kinds of topics. I've got a book called Old Earth Creationism on Trial. We don't have that here, but you can get it at Amazon. And a lot of the, uh, things, a lot of the specific facts I mentioned are in my book, Taking Back Astronomy, which I'd encourage you to get and have a look at that. We have a sign-up sheet for our free monthly magazine called Acts and Facts, and I think that would really bless you. Please sign up for that. It's totally free. We just want to bless you. Check us out on the web as well at icr.org and our special student ministry, yourorigensmatter.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. We're going to spend about 30 or so minutes having a discussion from the stage on these topics. And then we're going to get questions from you. So we're just going to get some of the... Uh, obstacles out of the way here and uh, start off. And I thought I'd start by just asking first Dr. Ross to maybe spend just a couple of minutes responding to whatever he'd like to respond to with regard to Dr. Lyle's uh, presentation. And then we'll have Dr. Lyle respond to anything he'd like to comment uh, on Dr. Ross's initial presentation. So Dr. Ross, go ahead, sir. Sure. Well, what I heard was the claim that we can't observe the past and that the rates of change can't be tested. And uh, the Bible tells us the rates of change are something that, you know, the Bible actually tells us that the laws of physics don't change. And in astronomy, we can't measure the present. We can only measure the past. That's why I tell my wife, I'm not responsible for the present. I'm an astronomer. <laughs> and the principle there is it takes like time to travel from these objects to our telescope. So in astronomy, we have direct access to the past, in fact, we can actually observe so far back in time, we can watch God create the universe. And this explains why in astronomy, we get the most compelling scientific evidence that a God beyond space and time uh, created the universe. So once again, seven places the Bible tells us that the laws of physics don't change. And in astronomy, we can actually test that the laws of physics haven't changed. Every time we look at the light of a star or a galaxy, we have an opportunity to measure what the laws of physics were at the look back time that's appropriate for the star or the galaxy. And it confirms that there hasn't been any change in the laws of physics to better than one part in 10 quadrillion. Now, I also heard arguments, um, you know, seven arguments about why uh, uh, billions of years is inconsistent with uh, science. And it was for this reason, Jason, we had a televised debate a number of years ago. I challenge you to defend these evidence in front of an audience of astronomers. Uh, you did turn that down, which is why I went with Danny Faulkner. And again, I would recommend that you get that longer debate. And also, in my book, I dealt with all seven of the evidences that you presented. Well, let me just give a couple. The salt argument assumes that Earth has no plate tectonics to recycle the salt. And so there's nothing in the salt that would tell us that, that it's inconsistent with the billions of years old uh, Earth. The recession of the moon assumes that there's no tidal walking between the moon and the Earth in the past. And with the moon being closer to the Earth, there would have to be some tidal walking. And therefore, the recession of the moon is not inconsistent with billions of years. Spiral arms, if you use the latest models for density waves, it's very consistent with these spiral arms existing for billions of years. And also, uh, the model that you're hearing from Jason assumes there's no ongoing star formation. If you don't have ongoing star formation, indeed, I agree that galaxy spiral arms collapse. And we observed that. But we got ongoing star formation. But of course, what you heard is he doesn't believe in star formation. The argument about the blue stars. Uh, well, we also see red stars, which are old. And what we see in the universe are stars that are young and stars that are old. And Jason's argument presumes no new stars are forming. But I have numerous colleagues who have spent their entire careers observing star formation throughout the universe. It's true we can't see a single star going from a gas cloud to becoming a star. It takes too long. But we can see all the different stages by looking at many different uh, star formation 
situations in our galaxy. Star formation is something that's firmly established in the astronomical community. Comets, he's assuming there's no Earth cloud. But the truth is we've observed Earth cloud comets. And we actually see Earth clouds around other stars. We see Kuiper belts. There is no comet problem uh, for uh, the age of the universe. Um, and let me see if I missed anything here. Internal heat, oh, the, the magnetic field of the Earth. You heard me say in my talk, we have measurements from the ice cores that establish that Earth's magnetic field is between half a Gauss and two Gauss over the past 35,000 years. The problem is young Earth creations assume an exponential decay uh, over time with only tiny oscillations. The truth is the oscillations are large. And like with Jupiter, you're presuming a simplistic model uh, for the magnetic fields, and uh, that's not the case. You can go into the scientific literature and uh, see that this has uh, been resolved. And again, uh, this is something I've taken on in my book, A Matter of Days, and a new edition will be out within a couple of months, uh, which gives the latest scientific reports on this. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Dr. Lyle, anything to comment on with regard to Dr. Ross's first uh, opening statement? Sure, thank you. Um, with regard to yom, the meaning of the word day, it can, in certain contexts, mean a longer period of time, but not in the context of Genesis 1. Because, you see, it's when it's part of a prepositional phrase, like in the day of the Lord, usually in poetic literature or in prophetic literature, which uses a lot of symbolism. Um, it's, it can be used that way, but not when it's bound by evening and morning and with a number with it and so on. So God has used the appropriate indicators so that he, he knows that, so that we can know that he made in six days. And he tells us that's the basis for our work week. So if God really created over millions of years, we'd have a long work week. Um, let's see. The idea that, you know, too much happens on day six, uh, well, the, the only thing that really would take any time is the naming of the animals. It doesn't, it doesn't say that, that Adam had to watch the trees grow or that, it doesn't even say he had to tend the garden on that day. It just says he placed them there um, and he gave them instructions. But we don't know that he began working immediately. So you've got to read the text very carefully there. Let's see, Newton believing in an old earth, that's, that's an appeal to authority. And in any case, in that same letter, he says he wouldn't be willing to defend anything that he wrote in that letter. So I think it's a little bit strange to use that as an argument. Uh, let's see, most of the, well, I think the, the seven evidences that were presented, all of them assume uniformitarianism and to some extent naturalism uh, in that stars allegedly form naturally and so on. I believe that God spoke the stars into existence on day four. He spoke and they stood fast. Isn't that what the Bible teaches? Um, the idea that gravity has to take a certain amount of time to collect to form a star. Again, that's uniformitarianism. The idea that the universe's rate of expansion is known and that we can allegedly see that by looking back in time. Again, that makes assumptions about light travel time. That makes assumptions about the speed of light being the same in all directions. I will comment briefly on the uh, anisotropic synchrony convention, which Dr. Ross brought up. This is my model for distant starlight. I think that the speed of light can be different in different directions depending on how we define it. There has been a rumor going around the internet that this creates a gravitational field, and I think that Hugh has latched onto that rumor, but it doesn't, because it's not the curvature of space-time that causes the speed of light to be different in different directions, but rather the definition that we use for the tensor of the electromagnetic and, and uh, permittivity and permeability of free space. And so it's kind of like switching to a polar, you, you, you've used a, you know, graphs, you've ever used maybe a polar graph. You can plot equations either in rectilinear coordinates or in polar coordinates. When you switch to polar coordinates, it doesn't create a gravitational field, it doesn't create a black hole on the piece of paper. You're just using a different coordinate system, you see. And so that really doesn't create a gravitational field at all. And therefore, we're really looking at the present when we look into the universe. We're looking at it today. And in any case, when we do astronomy, we're doing it today. That's when the light hits your eye, and so I think that's reasonable uh, to call that today. Let's see. With radiometric decay, there's been a lot that we've written on that. I'm not going to hit every, every point that he did for time's sake, but I just did, would encourage you to look at the rate research. There's compelling evidence that the radiometric decay rates were different in the past. And that doesn't necessarily mean a change in the laws of physics. Uh, we can, there are certain kinds of radioactive decay we can speed up in a laboratory, bound state beta decay of the rhenium strontium. We can do that in a laboratory. We're not changing laws of physics, we're changing conditions. And then the radioactive decay speeds up under certain conditions. Uh, that being said, God can temporarily change the laws of nature if he wants to. I agree that God has created the universe with a certain amount of stability and he's promised that the basic cycles of nature will be in the future as they have been in the past. But one, that wouldn't have applied during the creation week 
It's since the creation week that God upholds the universe in a consistent way. During the creation week, God's speaking things into existence, something he's not doing today. He's going above and beyond the laws of nature, which represent the way God normally upholds the universe today. But can God do a supernatural miracle today? I say yes, of course he can. He's God, he can do what he wants. That's not a problem, not a problem at all. With the ice cores, that assumes that, they're, that, the, that the layers are annual. And by the way, they may be annual today. But the uniformitarian assumption is that they've always been annual. We don't really know that. We know that storms can create more than one uh, layer in these ice cores. And by the way, when you get down deep, they, they're very hard to see. They get compressed, and they, you, you can't really dis see individual ice cores. But we've answered that, too, as well on ICR.org, so check us out there as well. With the idea that all these different lines of evidence uh, line up with 13.8 billion years, where there was a time when they all agreed on 400 million years, and then there was a time when they all agreed on uh, you know, 4 billion years, and so on. Data that, that do not agree, or, or conclusions that don't agree with the standard, tend not to be published. So there's a selection effect that we, need to, uh, that we need to take in consideration. And it's not that red stars are old, by the way. It's just that they have the potential to last for a long time because they have a big gas tank, actually a small gas tank, but they, they're very fuel efficient. They don't, they're not very luminous. And so when you see a red star, you're not seeing a star that's old. You're seeing one that potentially can be old. And so my, my indication is that if the universe had red stars only, that would suggest uh, that would at least be more indicative of billions of years. But the fact that we have blue stars, and we really don't see them forming. We really don't. We've never seen gas in the process of collapsing in on itself. Uh, that suggests that stars really don't form today. And there are several physical processes that work against that. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. Let's, let's have a bit of a discussion. And maybe we'll start here with Dr. Ross asking uh, Dr. Lyle a question, and then we'll just keep going back and forth until it gets boring. It won't. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Ross. Well, I think the core of the debate is, you know, are there significant changes in the laws of physics? I mean, again, the rate study said that. If there aren't dramatic changes in, say, the radiometric decay rates, the universe has to be billions of years old. And uh, Jason, I heard you refer to these experiments, and it's true that if you induce high pressure and temperature changes, you can alter the decay rate, but the alteration is way less than 1%, which you need in the young Earth models at least a factor of a million. And again, as we look at the radiometric decay rates in distant stars, we see the decay is the same. Likewise, with the xenon isotopes, it tells us that plutonium did exist on the early Earth, and decay rate is the same as it is today. Uh, now, uh, this is something I think the rate people have been very honest about, that uh, there has to be these very dramatic changes. But again, the scientific evidence doesn't support it, and the Bible doesn't support it when it makes the claim that the laws of physics are established at the creation event and will remain until the return of Christ. The uh, percentage by which some of these radiometric decays have been accelerated, some, in some cases it's enormous, Hugh. The, um, the rhenium-strontium reaction, for example, if you look at that, has been accelerated by a factor of a billion. That's more than enough to uh, account for the different uh, decay rates. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that that's necessarily the way God did it. My point is that if we humans can speed up certain kinds of radioactive decay by a factor of a billion, certainly God can. And so it's not a problem for him. Uh, I'm not suggesting that God necessarily used natural processes to speed up radioactive decay, but he may have. But the point is, we know that there's some ways to do it. And I'm open to God using supernatural activity. When, he, when Jesus calmed the storm, when he, when he raised Christ from the dead, I don't think that he was necessarily using natural processes. I think that God can uh, temporarily suspend the laws of nature that he upholds, by the way, and I certainly think that during the creation week, God was doing things that are beyond natural law, speaking into existence uh, new animals. I think you would hopefully agree that God's... No, I, I totally agree with that. I'm saying God certainly can uh, intervene supernaturally Good. and transcendently as well as transformationally. Good. But he doesn't erase the evidence of his miracle. When he performs a miracle, just like with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, he didn't erase the historical evidence of the event. Okay, so if, he excel so if he accelerated decay, there ought to be evidence of it. For example, um, excess helium in rocks, because that's exactly what we find. One of the byproducts of, ex of radioactive decay is helium, and helium is a gas, and it's a very light gas and very slippery, and rocks are porous. Helium will leak through gas with time, and we've been able to measure the rate at which that helium has leaked through the rocks, and we know it's quite rapid. And we found that it's cons the, the, there's a lot of helium trapped in these rocks. If, if, it, if the radioactive decay had happened slowly throughout time, 
over billions of years and happened billions of years ago, then the helium should be gone by now, and yet it's still there. And so that suggests that indeed, God accelerated the, the radioactive decay, or maybe he used the natural process well, to accelerate the radioactive decay. Well, there's a reason why scientists don't look at helium diffusion. Helium diffusion is complex. I've worked with helium. It's the slipperiest molecule or slipperiest atom you can possibly find. That's the point. Uh, and well, the point is that it's not a reliable age indicator because it can slip in, it can slip out. The diffusion models are extremely complex, but that's not the case with the lead byproducts. When uranium and thorium decay, it produces helium, but it also produces lead. And so, for example, when we look at uh, a particular sample, uh, we can measure the amount of uranium-238, the amount of uranium-235, thorium-232, and each of those radiometric uh, isotopes decays into a separate isotope of lead, 206, 207, and 208. And lead only comes from the radiometric decay of these elements. Uh, therefore, we actually have six independent ways of measuring the age of a sample by looking at the quantities of the three lead isotopes, the uranium isotopes, the thorium isotope, all of which where we have very good models on the diffusion. I mean, they're heavy, so they don't move around easily. Helium is extremely light. And so those six tools consistently establish that we're living on a planet that's 4.5662 billion years old, with a precision of five places the decimal. Notice in the scientific literature, helium is never used as a dating technique because we realize it's not reliable. Now, if you wanted to use a gas, I would suggest argon. It's still not very reliable, but unlike helium, it's heavy. And so, for example, the moon has an argon atmosphere. We know it only comes from the decay of, of uh, potassium-40, and the quantity of argon we see in the moon is consistent with the moon being four and a half billion years old. Likewise, Earth's atmosphere is 1% argon, which is consistent with the same age. We never use helium. Uh, the reason that most secular scientists don't use helium is because it gives them an answer that they don't like. That's the fact not the that, reason. Yes, it really is. It's because we, we can measure the rate at which helium leaks through rocks. It's been done, Hugh, and it's very fast. It's very fast. It's That's temperature the dependent. It's too fast. <laughs> yes, and because of that, there shouldn't be any helium left in these rocks if they were really billions of years old. You, is there any way to get at the past without making assumptions? Well, this is the whole point, is that in astronomy, we have direct access to the past. It's not like paleontology. We're inferring the past and making assumptions. As I mentioned, in astronomy, we have no access to the present. We only have access to the past. Now, of course, it assumes that the velocity of light doesn't change. However, the velocity of light changes at any point over cosmic history. It rules out the possibility of life. So you sitting there is evidence that the velocity of light has never changed, and we can measure the velocity of light in the spectral lines of stars and galaxies, which also establishes it hasn't changed. And on that basis, we know we're directly observing the past. It's not indirect, it's a direct observation. And that's what I love about astronomy. We can actually observe 100% of the history of the universe by looking at objects that are close by, where the light travel time, like for the moon, is one and a half seconds. Or we can go all the way back and look at the polarization of the cosmic background radiation, and we get an image of the universe when it's only a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old, and everything in between. All right, I apparently haven't had enough smart water this morning, so could, could you unpack why we wouldn't be here if the speed of light had changed at all in the past, and then I'll ask Dr. Lyle to respond. Go ahead. Well, I think this is something we both agree on. It's part of the anthropic principle. Uh, there's certain constants of physics that must have particular values just to enable the existence of light. I mean, probably the easiest way for a lay audience to understand it is E equals MC squared. I found that everybody knows that equation. They don't know F equals MA, but they know E equals MC squared. And C is the velocity of light, M is mass, E is energy. So for example, uh, some young Earth creations will claim that the velocity of light uh, was a million times faster for Adam than it was for us. But that would make the heat coming out of the sun a trillion times hotter. And the Bible tells us that the earth was not incinerated by the heat of the sun at the time of Adam. So that's one way of getting a, a kind of a crude handle 
on why the velocity of light can't change. So you're saying if C changes, then everything about reality changes? Almost. Almost. Yeah. Dr. Lowe? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't think the speed of light has changed significantly, but I do think that we can't measure the speed of light in one direction. That's something that's called the conventionality thesis. And therefore, when we see light, the only thing you can say about it is if you made a round trip, if we sent light out to a distant mirror in space and bounced it back, that would take a long period of time. Uh, many people assume that it, it, on a one-way trip it takes a long period of time, but the fact is we don't really know that. And there have been physicists who have pointed out that you can, you can actually assume the speed of light is infinite toward you. Um, Sarkar and Stachel uh, wrote a paper on that some time ago. And they're not, as far as I know, they're not creationists. They just thought it was interesting that you can actually look at the universe in real time if we use that convention. I don't really have a problem with using the isotropic convention and saying, you know, you're looking at the past, but even then, you're only looking at one point in time. You're, you're looking at one point and you're not, he said, not looking at the present then. And so you still can't determine how things have changed with time. But I would argue that scripturally it makes sense that God is using what I call the anisotropic synchrony convention, the idea that we see the universe in real time. One of the reasons I believe that is because in uh, Genesis when God creates the stars, he creates the sun, moon, and stars also on day four. And he says, let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years, and to give light upon the earth. And the text says, and it was so. And that suggests to me that the light uh, landed upon earth immediately. Stars immediately fulfilled their God-ordained purpose to give light upon the earth. And that's something that would, we would expect if we're seeing the universe in real time. So Jason, how would you then respond to someone who said, but the observational evidence shows the universe is expanding and came from a single point? Well, I would say, the, I think there is evidence that the universe is expanding. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it exploded into existence billions of years ago. Some of you are expanding a bit. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence billions of years ago. Just because something is bigger today than it was in the past does not imply that it came from a point. So I believe that God, God created the universe with some size because the Earth's in it when he makes it, and then he stretched it out a bit since then. You. Well, the Bible does claim that there's a space-time origin to the universe. So if we have a space-time origin of the universe, the universe has to start off very small. We actually have images of the universe which shows the galaxies jam much more tightly together in the past than they are today. So we can actually observe the, the rate in which the universe expands. We can measure the expansion rate over the entire history of the universe. That was a point I made. Everywhere we look, we see the same expansion rate, which is why it's really not possible but to avoid a conclusion. You isn't the universe accelerating right now, however? Isn't that what WAMP showed, or the, the WMAP? Right, that's what I mentioned. There's about a 1% difference in the expansion rate over the history of the universe. It's now accelerating, whereas mm -hmm. in the early part of the universe, it was decelerating. But the difference in the expansion rate during the deceleration era compared to the present era where it's accelerating, uh, we're only talking about a 1% difference. But the very fact that we can see a change from deceleration to acceleration is evidence that we live in a billions of years old universe. And just to make it clear, I don't think Genesis is saying that the stars were created by God on the fourth day. It says, let there be the great lights. And I think you have to interpret in the context of the book of Job, where Job talks about how God wrapped the early earth with clouds that kept the seas of the earth dark. So when you go back to creation day one, where it says, let there be light, it's not God creating light, it's God transforming the atmosphere so that light could come through. What happened on day four? That's when God transformed the atmosphere again so that the creatures on the surface of the earth could finally see the objects that are responsible for the light. That's when it went transparent. Let, let me see if I understand this right then. You're saying, you're taking this, the standard Big Bang cosmology view that the universe came from a single point actually from nothing and has expanded from a single point and is accelerating about one percent more than it was at a previous point right. Jason you're okay. saying that God created the universe of some size and then sent it accelerating is yeah. that is that correct there's no logical reason to assume that it starts as a point God can create space-time in any condition that he wishes and uh, then regarding the creation of the stars on day four, the Hebrew word asa, to make. God made the greater light, the lesser light, the stars also. And there's also a Hebrew word et, which is untranslated in English. It has no comparison, but it, it connects the object of the action back to the action verb. So 
and, and, and both the sun, the moon, and the stars are connected to asa, which is to make. There's a different Hebrew word for appear, like when and the see, land appeared. I don't appeared. deny that. I do believe God made the stars, just not on day four. Well, but the text indicates that right, he did make hold them on, on day four. Hold on a second. Four. Now we're getting into the Bible. And this is supposed to stay on the science, and both of you guys are guilty of going to the Bible. I'm All sorry right, I didn't right. stop it before then, but let's, let's just try and, and, and stay on the science. And I'm going to ask you gentlemen to be extremely gracious. You both are. But you, let me start with you. If someone said you, you had to believe in a young earth, what argument from an astronomical viewpoint, a scientific viewpoint, would you say is Jason's strongest? Well, you heard me say earlier, and also Jason agreed, is that you won't find a scientist who doesn't feel that the Bible forces a young earth interpretation that would actually say there's any scientific evidence uh, for uh, a young universe or a young earth. In fact, in the 1987 Supreme Court hearing, a geophysicist said it's in the same category as a flat earth. And as an astronomer, I would find it easier to argue for a flat earth than I would to argue for a universe that's only 10,000 years old. Well, he did give several what seemed to be scientific explanations that could align with a young earth. Are any of them possible? No, not a single one. I mean, every Could you tell us what you really think? <laughs> And you're saying that you unpack the reasons why in the book, A Matter of Yes, Days. yes, yes. Jason, same question, opposite conclusion. What it seems think? to me that all of the arguments that Dr. Ross put forward are based on uniformitarianism and naturalism. Uh, now, since I reject those presuppositions, I don't find any of them credible. However, if I were to grant uniformitarianism and naturalism, then I would, all of those would be reasonable arguments. So it really comes down to whether or not we believe that, that God can supernaturally create the universe and that God can change rates and conditions. That's really what it's going to come down to. Outside of the Bible, is there any way we can get at the past without assuming uniformitarianism? Is there any? Yeah, through, well, through some other history book. But you can't scientifically uh, measure the past. And that's one of the things that I think was important to, to bring up. Uh, science deals with the way the universe works today, and it tells us a lot about the way the universe works today. But it is ill-equipped to deal with the past. We can make guesses, but those guesses are going to be based on assumptions, and you're going to have to make an assumption about rates and conditions in the past. It'll either be uniformitarianism or catastrophism, or you're, there could be somewhere in between, but it's going to be one of those assumptions. Do you have a book that responds to what you have said, similar to his book, that's respond to what you have said? Which, no, I'm, scientific. <laughs> scientific. These guys always want to go to the Bible, don't they? No, do you, do you have a book that responds yes. to his scientific arguments? Yes, I, I have a book that deals with some of the scientific issues. Taking Back Astronomy deals with many of them. We have that at our table. Taking and then the other one we astronomy. have is called Old Earth Creationism on Trial. Okay. Uh, for those of you that don't know, in addition to the tables out here, there's tables down a... Right behind me, there's a, there's a, a, a hallway with a bunch of tables as well. In fact, you can get all of the presentations at a table behind me. So if, obviously you can't make all the presentations, you can go buy them. And there are other tables uh, right next to that table. So don't just go out here, go behind me and see the other tables there. In fact, I think your table might be back there if I'm not mistaken. All right, at this point, uh, I would like to get some input from you. And I want to start with a, a professor at SES, and then we'll go to uh, your uh, particular questions. Is uh, Dr. Richard Howe in the house? Dr. Richard Howe? We're starting with you, my friend, and we're going to start with your question, because you and I have talked about this question before, and you can explain it much better than I can, so if you would, we'll start with your question, and then we'll go to your questions here in the audience. Dr. Howe. Thank you, Dr. Turek. Um, well, my question may be less relevant to Dr. Lyle. I wasn't sure I followed this synchronicity thing, so this may be relevant to that. And I've had the opportunity to ask this question to others that are here in the audience, physicists and astronomers, but I want to hear what you two think. Given the, the, the conventional view that, as I understand, is you're looking at an object away from you, you're seeing it the time ago that it took the light to travel from it to you. If that's true, then it follows that as I look further out into the universe, I'm looking further into the past. 
But if the Big Bang Theory is true, the further I go into the past, the closer everything is together, not the further away. So if I saw the universe a second after the Big Bang, it, so if I'm looking into the past, why aren't things looking closer and closer rather than further and further away? It seems like a contradiction. Well, me. they actually do look closer and closer together as you look farther and farther away. We well, here, see let me, my, I don't think I phrased it very carefully. <clears throat> if I see a quasar that's so many billions of miles away, then presumably that's what it looks like, quote-unquote looks, so many billions of years ago. But one of the things that it looks like to me today is it looks billions of light years away. That's what it looks like to me, which means billions of years ago, it was billions of light years away from me, which is a contradiction. So why does it look that far away if, I'm, if what I'm seeing is what it looked like that long ago? Because that long ago, it wouldn't have looked billions of light years away. So it, well, it seems like there's a contradiction in the model and maybe the contradiction's in my question. Yeah, because say when we look at uh, quasars, we're seeing quasars when the universe was, say, only two or three billion years old. And we notice, for example, is we don't see quasars up close. It's because the quasar is a phase in the early history of galaxies. So we only see them in supergiant galaxies that are far away, because that's when the black hole is sucking in huge quantities of gas. So you're only going to be seeing quasars in gas-rich galaxies, and as galaxies get older and older, they, dis, you know, they lose, use up more and more of their gas. And so today, for example, galaxies close by, about 90% have stopped forming new stars. We're in one of the few galaxies that's still forming stars. Uh, but if you go back and, and at far away, you see that most of the galaxies are still forming stars. And this is where you see the quasar phenomena. So again, it's the look back time. The farther away you see, the earlier in the history of the universe you look. So you're actually looking at the universe when, say, it was a toddler, whereas today you're looking at the universe and it's middle aged. Does that help? Thank you. All right, we're going to go to your questions now, and uh, 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 one warning. There will be no speeches, okay? Go right to the question, because if you go into a speech, I'm moving on, all right? We'll start with this gentleman right here. Yes, sir, your question. Okay, my question is uh, for Dr. Lyle. Uh, what is the young Earth uh, explanation for cosmic background radiation? Good, very good question. Uh, I don't know what the answer to cosmic microwave background is. It's, it's a radiation that's coming from all directions in space. My secular colleagues believe it's the leftover radiation from the Big Bang, and they're welcome to speculate on that, but there's no, I don't have any logical reason to believe that's what it is. Uh, it could indicate that the universe has an average temperature. Uh, any universe eventually would, would emit microwaves anyway. Uh, there is some evidence that it's actually not behind the farthest galaxies, but, but uh, closer interestingly. So it's actually in between the distant galaxies and us, in, in contradiction to what the Big Bang folks would, would think. And that, that evidence is the shadowing. As, as the uh, microwaves travel through galaxies, they get shadowed a bit, because uh, galaxies are not totally transparent to microwaves. And that's called the Sonia Zeldovich effect. And that's uh, observed, but it's not observed nearly as much as my secular colleagues were expecting. There was a paper that was written on this some years ago. It's speculative, but it's, it's interesting. So, so we're not really sure what that is, uh, but I don't have any reason to believe that the secular view is, is right. Uh, there is radiation coming from all directions in space, and uh, it's very interesting. Any comment on that, you? Well, uh, we can actually measure the temperature of the cosmic background radiation at different look-back times. And the fact that we see it cooling off the way we do establishes that it really is the radiation from the cosmic creation event and that the cosmic creation event occurred 13.79 billion years ago. Again, look at the Planck papers. They, they got published just this past March. It's the best measurements to date on the radiation from the cosmic creation event. Yes, sir. My question is for uh, Dr. Lyle. But Dr. Lyle, would you say if uh, we didn't have the biblical evidence, would you say there's enough evidence to warrant belief in a young earth? And if not, does that pose a problem for young earth creationism as a science? If we didn't have the biblical text, first of all, I would say we wouldn't have a basis for science anyway. 
because uh, it's because of the Bible that we expect the universe to be understandable. We expect God to uphold it in at least a more or less consistent way. He can do miracles if he wants to, but he, normally he upholds it by laws of nature. And that's what makes science possible, is the biblical worldview. Is there evidence uh, apart from scripture for a, a young earth? Yeah, and I, I think some of the, the ones that I mentioned are, are very powerful because even, they even assume uniformitarianism. You see, I mean, the magnetic field decay and so on, those assume uniformitarian conditions, and yet they still end up with, a, with, a, uh, with an age estimate that is much less than billions of years. I find the, um, we mainly stuck with evidence in space, but there's amazing evidence on the Earth. For example, a C14, the fact that C14 is an unstable variety of carbon, and it doesn't last millions of years. In fact, if the entire Earth were C14 in one million years, you wouldn't have an atom of it left. It's got a short half-life. And yet we find it uh, buried deep down in, uh, in, in rock layers that are well insulated from cosmic rays that would you know, allegedly produce new C14. We find it in everything. You find it in diamonds, you find it in, in uh, fossils as long as there's sufficient carbon left. So I think there is a lot of evidence really for, for a young Earth and a young universe. But since you can't, you can't get evolution in 6,000 years, my secular colleagues would reject it out of hand. Well, I would say you can't get evolution in 13.7 billion sure. either. But right. go ahead, you. <laughs> Paul. I would agree with that. In fact, when the Big Bang was first proposed, astronomers rejected it because it didn't give enough time for evolution. Whatever illusions the biologists have had, the astronomers have always known, if it's only billions of years, there's no way to defend a Darwinian interpretation. But with respect to carbon-14, we expect to find a background level of carbon-14 everywhere. Why? Because in the Earth, we have uranium and thorium everywhere, and we get nitrogen everywhere. So there's going to be a background production of carbon-14, and it should come in at a level of about 58,000 years date. And that's, that's just the background you're going to get everywhere. So I'm not at all surprised we're finding a low-level carbon-14 signal in diamonds and zircons and coal. It's at the level we would expect from an old Earth perspective. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Ross? Because the last two have been for Dr. Lyle. Yes, sir, go ahead. Dr. Ross, um, you told us in your opening that you believe that God created Adam. Um, assuming you don't believe that God created him as a newborn infant, if a scientist were to measure Adam an hour after God spoke him into his existence, how old would that scientist determine him to be? That scientist would determine that Adam was created an hour ago. Now, why? Because a scientist would measure the uh, cholesterol in the blood serum of Adam. It would come in at 60 milligrams per liter, which is what you get for a newborn child. Uh, that scientist would look at the face and the skin of Adam and notice that there's no liver spots. I mean, you give me a 12-year-old boy and I can show you liver spots on her skin. And so, and wouldn't find any chipped teeth or gray hair. He would measure to be brand new. It's the chicken or the egg. And when it comes to advanced life, God makes the chicken first because the egg can't take care of itself. But Adam was created brand new. Dr. Lau? It's a really good question because, of course, it depends on what the scientist is using as his criteria. If he's using height and he assumes that Adam came about by the same process that people come about today, namely growing from a baby, he would not assume an hour ago. He would assume that it took years for him to grow to that height. Um, if he's using, uh, you know, the rate at which bones mature or whatever, or the rate at which the brain grows or whatever, he would get an age that's much older than the true age. On the other hand, if he was using cholesterol levels, he, he probably would get a much younger age. So he would get inconsistent data, interesting. He would get an inconsistent answer, assuming uniformitarian st standards. And by the way, that's exactly what we find in the universe, isn't it? When we apply uniformitarian standards, we get inconsistent data. We get a recession of the moon that's much less than 4.5 billion years. And then we get other things that, that seem to be older than that. We, we, after all, live in a supernaturally created universe. Hmm? Okay, go ahead. Uh, to Dr. Lyle, uh, your position on starlight travel time is different than your uh, colleague, Dr. Humphreys. I was curious what his position on your position is on that. <laughs> How do they differ, Jason? Start there. Okay, yeah. Um, Dr. Humphreys believes that gravitational time dilation is a good answer to distant starlight. 
And I think, he, I think it's a brilliant thing to try. I'm not totally persuaded that his model is correct, but I think he's, uh, he's come up, it's, a, it's, it's true that time can flow at different rates under different circumstances. And if the Earth were in a gravitational well, time would flow a little bit more slowly here than it does in distant space. And it is possible in principle to use that to solve the distant starlight problem. Uh, I just, I'm just not convinced that the math works out in his model. And I've, and I've chatted with him about that, he knows that. Um, regarding what he thinks about mine, I, I'm not really sure, but the last, when I first presented it to him, he thought that it was a really interesting idea and he encouraged me to continue to uh, pursue that. Uh, I don't know if he's changed his mind since then, but that was the last I heard on it. You, any comment on that? Do you know the difference between the two views? You want to yeah, I do know the difference between the two views. and I have dialogued with both men on it. Um, and, you know, you heard me make the presentation, Lyle, about the fact that it does generate a gravitational field. The only way out of it is to deny the theory of general relativity, which I don't think you're prepared to do. And so, again, if you want to push it, try presenting that in front of physicists who are familiar with general relativity. We actually have a young lady that wants to ask a question, so. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Lyle, I appreciated your philosophical explanation for interpreting data, uh, scientific data. Thank you. Um, the Genesis account speaks of mornings and evenings in defining a notion of a day for days one, two, and three, yet day four created the stars and the moon, um, which is how our life experience defines morning and evening. How do you scientifically explain days one, two, and three? Okay, yeah. Since God didn't make the sun until day four, but he did, he did make a light source on the first day. God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God divided the light from the darkness, the Bible says. So apparently for the first three days, God provided, perhaps supernaturally, perhaps used a temporary light source, God supernaturally provided light for one side of the earth. The earth was already rotating because we have evening and morning. As long as you have a light source and a rotating planet, you're going to have ordinary day and ordinary night. The sun really doesn't have much to do with the length of the day. It's primarily the rotation of the earth that causes us to have ordinary days and ordinary nights. And then uh, on the fourth day, God replaces that temporary light source with the sun, the moon, the stars also. Uh, I think perhaps one reason why he may have done that is to show that the sun is not really the primary source of life. God is the primary source of life. And so he displaced it until the fourth day. And he doesn't even call it by name, lest the Hebrews be inclined to worship it as a deity. It's just the greater light and the lesser light and the, and the stars also. You, any comment on that? Well, you'd have to replace the sun uh, by a sun. Whereas the light source that would be there for the first three days, but not only have to have light, it would have to have heat, it would have to have gravity. It would have to have the same spectral characteristics of the sun. So it's basically interpreting the Bible as saying there was sun A for the first three days, and God removed that sun and replaced it with a second sun of the identical characteristics for days four and the following uh, without destroying life on planet Earth. And the text does tell us there was life on creation day three. I think there was life all the way back to creation day one. And therefore, this trade model uh, would be a problem. There's nothing in the text to hint uh, that God traded one son for another son. Anyone have a question here for Dr. Ross? Dr. Ross. On that subject, uh, in Revelation, in fact, the scripture says that, that God is the, the light. And there is no sun and moon. But my question is, is... Is there a correspondence between the, uh, the light in the beginning and then the sun and the moon on the fourth day, and then in Revelation there's no more sun and moon, and then God is the light? Right. H how do you interpret that? Yeah, you can get my book, Why the Universe is the Way it Is, where I make the point that the Bible teaches that there's no change in the laws of physics from the creation event until the return of Christ. But with the return of Christ... God replaces this universe with a new creation. Revelation 21 and 22, as God spoke the universe into existence, he will speak it out of existence. Second Peter and Isaiah speak about God removing the universe through wrapping it up like a scroll. It disappears in a fiery heat. That sounds like some kind of singularity event to me. And then we have the new creation. And what I love about Christianity it's the one and only religion that teaches a two-creation model. God creates this universe as a tool in God's hand to eliminate evil and suffering once and for all and bring redemption to people who choose to receive that redemption. With a new creation, there is no evil or possibility for evil. 
Therefore, you don't need gravity, thermodynamics, or electromagnetism. I argue those laws are crucial for the elimination of evil and suffering. But the new creation, where evil and suffering can never exist again, there's no need for those laws. That's when the laws of physics change. And the light we have in the new creation is not electromagnetism. Therefore, there's no need for the sun or the stars or the moon. Everything will glow with light. There's no shadows, it tells us. With electromagnetism, you get shadows. The light in the new creation will be radically different. Jason? It could be supernaturally created light is possible, certainly. Uh, that's definitely a possibility. Um, we know that it's possible to have light without the sun. That's the point. We've got light in here. We don't have the sun in here. As long as you have light in a rotating planet, you're going to get day and night. And with regard to the new creation, I, just, I sure hope God doesn't take millions of years with that. Let's try and stay on the science as much as we can. We keep going back to the Bible here. Wait, do we have Christians in the room or something? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, Dr. Ross. Uh, in your answer to the gentleman's question on the radioactivity and the noise and the declining temperature, you said you could determine that the, I think you said the Earth was 13 point something billion years old, and earlier you said the Earth was four and a half to six billion. That's quite a discrepancy, and can you explain the difference in those yes. ages? The universe is 13.79 billion years old with an error bar of plus or minus 0 0.05 billion. You can check that out by going to the latest release of the W map and uh, the Planck satellite. The Earth is not as old as the universe. It can't be as old as the universe because we need plate tectonics to make the continents. That's right there in creation day three. And that requires that the Earth be super enriched with uranium and thorium, which comes from the burnt out ashes of previous generations of stars. So we really do need the Earth from the perspective of the Big Bang creation event to be quite a bit younger than the universe. And it measures through uranium and uh, thorium decay uh, to be 4.5662 billion years plus or minus 0 0.0001 billion. So that's known to very high precision. So yeah, the Earth is about a third the age of the, the universe. I wish you'd be more precise. <laughs> Dr. Lyle. Yeah, the precision sounds impressive, doesn't it? Although I will point out that it's outside the error bars of the previous measurement, which is outside the error bars of the previous measurement. So it's interesting, the secularists, every time they, they think it's this age within these error bars, and then oh, later it's this age within these error bars, and then later it's this age within these error bars, uh, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's a cute story, but I just don't have any reason to believe that. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, this may sound like a, a biblical question, but it's actually a scientific question. Just a simple question. Do you believe that uh, the flood in Genesis was worldwide or local? I believe... Hang on. Let's try and stay on astronomy. Can we please? No, no. Let's stay on astronomy. We, got, we, we could talk about the flood. That's a whole other topic. Let's stay on astronomy. Gerard, you had a question. What is it? Presuppositions? Well, come to the event with Jason this afternoon, and we'll talk about that. Because we're going we're gonna to talk about that. Yes, sir. So I've heard it said that, you know, we look in the distance and we see spiral galaxies, and some are farther away than others, so there are different ages, I'm assuming. Why do the spiral arms all look basically the same age as far as they're not twisting in on each other? Well, what we do see is that, say, if you look 10 billion light years away, about two-thirds of all the galaxies are spiral, whereas you look up close, only about 10% are spiral. And so what's happening is that many of the spiral galaxies are compactifying uh, into elliptical galaxies, and we can actually see how the spiral arms uh, change over the history of the universe. I mean, one of the unusual things is about our Milky Way galaxy is that over the past 10 billion years, its spiral arms have remained amazingly symmetrical. And uh, that's one of the fine-tuning arguments. As an astronomer, I can't see any other galaxy where advanced life is possible. And it's because of the way God uh, controlled the circumstances of our Milky Way galaxy that advanced life is possible here. But if we look at our sister galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, we can see that the spiral arms have been distorted. Uh, there's much more feathering uh, in the spiral arms than we see in our Milky Way galaxy. And that's a property. The spiral arms will tend to feather uh, more and more 
uh, as it gets older and older. So as you look far away, we see spiral arms with very little feathering as opposed to the ones that we're seeing uh, that are having short look back times. Jason. Yeah, and I would argue that the reason they look the same age is because they are the same age. They're a few thousand years old. They haven't experienced very much spiral wrapping. Uh, the galaxies in the distant universe, the spiral galaxies, look pretty similar to the ones nearby. Um, yes, the ratio is slightly different, but they, you can take a look for yourself at the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, take a look, and take a look at some nearby galaxies and decide for yourself. There are a variety of different kinds of spiral galaxies. There are grand design spirals, there are flocculants, there are um, galaxies that have different degrees of wrapping, but we see those at distance and we see them nearby, and I would suggest that's, that makes sense given the God of diversity, the God of Scripture. Yes, ma'am. Yes. This is for both doctors, please. The Bible is saying that God is light. Could we say if we were able to travel at the speed of light, would we in fact be in his presence and would time stop? Hmm. I think when, we're about out of time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll take that All one. All right, you go ahead. You're quoting 1 John chapter 1 where it says God is light. And then you've got three chapters of follow where it says God is truth, love, and light. And it's making the point, it's a spiritual point, the combination of God's love, God's truth, and God's life is the light of God. So there's a spiritual light that First John is speaking about and what astronomers are speaking about is electromagnetic radiation. Jason, anything to add? Amazingly, I, I agree with that. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can answer right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but to, uh, yeah, just to follow up. Just to answer the rest of your question, as you go close to the speed of light, time does slow down. Yeah, I do, I do think that that's a, John's referring to a, a spiritual component, though. But uh, yeah, time slows down, and theoretically, if you could reach the speed of light, time would stop completely. Let's do this. I know there are many more questions out here, but we only have three minutes left. I'd like to give each gentleman a minute or so just to kind of sum up what, what they'd like to sum up with regard to this topic. So since uh, Dr. Ross took the affirmative, we'll start with him. If you just want to spend a minute or two just summing up the arguments, and then we'll go to Dr. Lyle, and uh, then we'll move on to our next session. Dr. Ross. Well, I would simply say that uh, you know, our differences are testable. We can test them by different biblical texts, and it's important not just to look at Genesis, but to look at all 66 books of the Bible. It's not enough to take the Bible literally. We have to take it literally and consistently. That's why God gave us 66 books. So we can test our interpretation by one book by the interpretation we get from the other 65 books. And the same is true of the scientific disciplines. You know, one of the struggles I have with evolutionary biologists, they're only looking at one scientific discipline. They're ignoring, say, the physics of the sun and how that challenges their idea of Darwinian evolution. And likewise, on this subject, uh, we need to take an interdisciplinary approach. And I kind of saw that in your remarks, Jason, as you're referring to geology and, uh, as well as astronomy, and I would commend that. But again, I would say this is testable. Every day, we're making new discoveries from the book of nature, and those discoveries allow us to test our differing interpretations of the book of nature. They also allow us to test our differing interpretations of the book of scripture, because God can't lie or deceive. He gave us a book of nature. He gave us a book of scripture. Both are from the God from whom it's impossible to lie or deceive. And so they must agree. And where they appear to disagree, we've either made a wrong interpretation or we don't know enough. And that's the value of doing scientific research and theological research. We learn new things. And by those new things, we can test our differences and hopefully get closer and closer to the truth that God wants us to accumulate. By the way, just so you know, Reasons to Believe is a sponsor of this entire conference, so let that be known. Dr. Lyle? Uh, well, I want to thank you for having me out to speak. I want to thank Dr. Ross for his graciousness to me and for participating. Uh, I think one of the things that I hope you've seen in this, in this uh, dialogue is that there are a lot of assumptions that go into making any estimate of age. And I, I don't claim that any of my scientific arguments are proof because scientifically you just, you just can't prove the past. But for that reason, I think we need to really have confidence in God's word. I would encourage you to stand on biblical authority. Uh, God knew that we would not uh, understand the universe properly without help. And so he gave us his word. And that really should be the filter that we use through which we interpret the data. We really need to stand authoritatively on the word of God 
as Christ did in his earthly ministry, as the apostles did as well. And I know it's a great temptation to be intimidated by the, uh, by the secular scientists of our day. I understand that. I've, I've worked with some brilliant people, and I, and I don't mean to disparage their intelligence. There are brilliant people who believe in evolution, who believe in millions of years, and what have you. Uh, I'm not disputing their intelligence. I'm disputing their starting assumptions, because they, they, do, pres they do presume uniformitarianism and naturalism. And that can be intimidating. It can be intimidating for us to bow down to the, the God of millions of years, as it were. And that's always been a temptation, even in the Israelites, right? They, they tended to add other gods into their system. Remember Baal and, and uh, um, Elijah and, and trying to say, you know, if, if Baal's God, worship him. But if the Lord be Lord, worship him. And it can be discouraging when we see, uh, when we see all these different positions. But I'm, just, I'm encouraged by God's response to Elijah. He says, I've reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And we need to remember that God has reserved for himself many Christians who have not been intimidated by the secularists. You don't need to be intimidated by the secularists. Stand on the authority of God's word. The science will line up with it. it, it even if we don't see it today, uh, the science always will eventually confirm that God's word is true. Thank you, Dr. Lyle. By the way, we will touch on this issue again this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Lyle is going to be a part of a, a panel of three other or two other individuals. We'll be touching a little bit on presuppositionalism versus classical apologetics and also the age of the earth. So if you want to hear more of this, you can come to that event. Now, you are you speaking again today? Tomorrow. You are speaking again tomorrow. Don't forget to check out the products that both these gentlemen have brought. You has a matter of days, and you have the astronomy. What's the name of the book again? Taking Back Astronomy. Taking Back Astronomy. Let's give these gentlemen a hand, if you would. All right, we're done.